Hello? Hello? Working? All right, so everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming to Science on Tap. Those of you that may or may not know, this is our second event. We're trying to make it a monthly series. So, uh, yeah, nice turnout. Uh, we hope to have more. I, I will tell you more about this in the end. I, I would really like your feedback on how tonight's event goes. All right? So I'd appreciate any thoughts or you have. Free uh, beer. <laughs> you already got heckled. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, anyway, let's get started. Tonight's speaker, Nathan Givanji, uh, is going to tell us about climate change. I'm not going to introduce him. He, he can do it himself. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Casey. Um, yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this. Uh, so I am a I'm a Perry Hess postdoctoral fellow in the geosciences department at Princeton University. I got my PhD from Berkeley a couple years ago, uh, doing climate science uh, here. Uh, it's an amazing place to do climate science. Uh, I spent last year at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, which is just Princeton's hometown climate modeling center where they build global climate models, and I'm going to show you some results from global climate models. It's a big part of how we think about climate change are these models. Uh, climate modeling actually began here in Princeton uh, 50 or 60 years ago at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, with John Van Norman. So there really is a rich tradition of, of thinking about climate uh, here in this small town. All right, so how do we know what we know? Um, why, why am I posing that question? And I guess I want to talk about this because you know, you guys are here because you're interested in climate, and I'm sure you're, uh, you know, reading and listening to the conversation that we, as a country and scientific community, is everybody to turn the music off? Yeah, yeah, right. so, I love this song. This is I love it. You know, it's from the Coneheads soundtrack. This is like. And I think this specifically is, coming out of this. Yeah. Um, and so if you read articles, you, um, you listen to things on the radio, you hear a lot of claims about climate change. You hear claims about what CO2 is doing, what the temperatures are doing, what sea levels are doing, what uh, ice around the planet is doing. Um, but to my mind, there's it, these claims, there's, you know, you read an article online and they make a claim and there's no link to the evidence. Right? So you just have to sort of take the journalist or the writer's word for it. And if you say, well, I want to know more details, or that's something that's kind of vague, or how do I really know that's true? They don't give you anything. Right? And I find this frustrating. Um, and for people, and there's, there's so many different things being made, often antithetical to each other, how is someone supposed to puzzle it all out? And then you hear claims that the science is settled, that the science is settled. Right? Well, what does that even mean? Right? There's a whole universe of different scientific claims with different levels of certainty. So what does it even mean to say that the science is settled? And then if you, you know, in the, in the sense that one gets is that, oh, one is supposed to go to these IPCC reports, right, which are these tomes. There's three volumes of them. Just the one on physical science is 1,500 pages. And somehow you have a question about, you know, Arctic sea ice, and you're supposed to, as a non-specialist, be able to make your way through that and answer your question. And even I, as a specialist, it takes me hours to find an answer to a question, you know, combing through IPCC reports. So this talk aims at kind of ameliorating that. So I, I wanted to address a few very basic claims about climate science that we've all heard. And I want to show you the actual data that is the evidence for these claims. So basically what I did is I took the claims that we all hear and then I just went through the IPCC reports <laughs> and found the plot, you know, figure 10.15, you know, in chapter 10, page 30 of volume 10 of the IPCC report. Um, so that's what I'm going to show tonight. All right. So uh, I guess we should start at the start. So how do we know atmospheric CO2 is increasing? So maybe I'll just put the question to you guys. How do we know atmospheric CO2 is increasing? What would you say? Ice cores. Ice cores. So ice cores, right, those give us records that extend sort of further back in time than the uh, Mauna Loa records, which are taken from Hawaii. I think for contemporary climate change, uh, you typically turn to Mauna Loa. And if you want to get, get that in a, in a long-term context, you go to the ice cores. Um, so there's the Mauna Loa data, right? Uh, so this is often known as the Keeling curve. Um, and the scientists who start taking these, these measurements uh, in the, I guess, late 50s. Uh, and so this is a plot that many of you probably see, probably see. So this is parts per million of CO2 on the horizontal axis. 
a year on the, uh, on the vertical axis and a year on the horizontal. You see that it's creeping upwards at a slightly accelerating rate. And, and if you, you know, kind of tried to draw a straight, doom, straight line through that, you'd find that the increase is maybe one to two parts per million per year. Um, and this line has these, uh, these red wiggles. Does anyone know what those wiggles are? Seasonal change. There's a seasonal cycle in CO2, right? Because the forests, particularly in the north, are breathing in and breathing out CO2. They breathe CO2 in during the summer when photosynthesis is active and they're adding tree rings, right? They're adding biomass. And then as organic matter decays in the winter, this breathes the CO2 out. And that's why you get the seasonal fluctuations. All right, so this graph suggests that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. But it's one place, right? You get one rate of measurement from fitting a straight, a straight line to this, right? So if you're skeptical, you'd say, shoot, Mauna Loa, that's on top of a volcano. The volcano is emits CO2, right? That's where the CO2 in the atmosphere and the ocean comes from. So how can I be sure that this is really representative? So we go other places, right? You go to Tanzania. You go to the South Pole. You go to Alaska. And they all tell the same story. And it's not just qualitatively consistent, right? If you draw a straight line through these curves, you get the same 1 to 2 ppmv parts per million uh, per year from all these curves, right? And so it's not just this one Mauna Loa record that gives scientists confidence. It's the fact that you then go check this you know, across the globe, and it tells the same consistent story. Different groups forming you know, independent inquiries, arriving at consistent conclusions. That's where the confidence comes from. And that's going to be a theme throughout this talk. Right? It's independent lines of inquiry telling a consistent story. Right? Consistency is the key. All right. So. There's some evidence that the CO2 is increasing. But how do we know humans are behind it, right? Um, maybe there's been a lot of volcanic activity, right? Volcanoes are the source of CO2. Uh, maybe, you know, we also know that um, carbon is, uh, is kind of taken into the Earth where uh, you have subduction zones um, uh, in the Earth's crust. Um, so there's sort of geological sources and sinks that have nothing to do with us. How do we know that those aren't playing the role? So here's one thing you can do. You can, so what I plotted here, or not what I plotted, uh, and by the way, here are all the references, so you guys can, you know, I'll post these online, and you know, hopefully you guys can on my website, which is just novelgmd.com, um, and so you can take a look for yourself. Um, so what's plotted here is the annual change in the parts per million uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and you see that's kind of right around two, which is what I said you would get if you fit the straight line, the curves that I showed you in the last slide. And there's a few, uh, and this is versus time. So now what are these different lines and bars? So this one, this is interesting. So what researchers have done is they've taken inventories of all the fossil fuels produced across the globe. So they've looked at corporate records and countrywide inventories of all the gas and coal and oil that's been dug up. And you assume that what's been dug up in a year gets burned that year, so that you know companies aren't just stockpiling um, reserves that they've dug up. And then you can calculate, you know, if I burn all of that, how will it change atmospheric concentrations of CO2? And that gives this curve. And then these bars give you what's observed. So this is an average, or, so this comes from those direct CO2 uh, measurements that I showed you in the last slide. And what this says is that the fossil fuel CO2 that we have generated is enough to account for the observed increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's sufficient. Right? We have burned enough to account for the 2 ppmv roughly uh, a year increase that we see. But there's a gap there. So does that, does that throw a wrench in the argument? Or is that consistent? Are there other places the CO2 could go besides in the atmosphere? Ocean. The ocean, right? We hear the oceans are acidifying. They're acidifying because when CO2 dissolves in water, it's acidic, right? It's part of what makes soda taste good. Right? CO2 is dissolving. Um, so some of the CO2 goes into the ocean, makes it slightly more acidic, and some goes into the land, right? Plants are actually kind of feasting a little bit on this extra CO2, and they're adding more biomass, right? And you can actually um, make some observations from ocean flows of the additional CO2, and it's consistent. All right, so there's a story that kind of hangs together. But again, that's one calculation. You know, ideally, there'd be other lines of evidence. And indeed, there are, right? 
So another thing, and this is something I didn't learn until I went digging through the IC, IPCC reports to answer this question because, I mean, I have a PhD in climate science, but this research is research I did in September in preparation for a course I was going to help teach. And I didn't know the answers to these questions in September. Right? So even working scientists in the field aren't necessarily familiar with this evidence. All right, so there's another uh, kind of neat argument, which just says that, well, if the increase in CO2 is from combustion, well, combustion produces CO2, but the O2 in the CO2 is coming from atmospheric oxygen, right? But fire takes oxygen. So that means that if, you know, if this signal, so this is the CO2 here, this is the corresponding vertical axis, uh, this is time, uh, sorry, the labels are cut off. So what that says is if the CO2 is going up, the O2 should be going down. So people started measuring O2. And indeed, it's going down. And if you run the chemistry and say, oh, you know, I know how combustion works, so I know how much O2 should be going down uh, at the same time the CO2 is going up, it's quantitatively consistent. Right? So it's a whole separate chain of reasoning, a whole different measurement that also paints a consistent story right, with what we have here. Um, there's yet a third argument, which I won't go into, into detail, um, that has to do with isotopes of carbon. Um, and the point here is just that it also tells a consistent story that the the, 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 the isotopic composition of the carbon we're seeing in the atmosphere is changing, and it's consistent with burning of fossil fuels. Sorry, Ned. Yes, please. What happened in 1992? That is the, 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 an excellent question. Um, I don't know. We get some global recession. Uh, but the emissions don't really, um, the production doesn't really like level off that much, but there's a huge dip oh. here. Uh, so what I what I feel like I read uh, was that the, the sinks, so the land sink and the ocean sink, there's some natural variability in terms of how much they take up. Um, but I don't know how well understood that is, but that's my impression of it. But it's good. It's always good to look closely at these graphs and scratch your head and ask, what is that about? Uh, and please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. I don't have that many slides, so my aim was just to kind of go through the slides at a leisurely pace, interact with you guys, and then we can have a more open discussion. Okay, so we've seen evidence that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. We've seen some evidence that it comes from fossil fuel burning. But how do we know it's behind the observed warming? So let's take a look first at the observed warming. So this is another plot from the IPCC report. So what we have here is, so these are four independent uh, reconstructions of global temperature from land-based temperature stations. These are basically like thermometers in a box that are spread out all over the globe very unevenly. And so one has to make assumptions uh, and apply various methodologies to kind of fill in the gaps. And four different groups have made such reconstructions. Uh, and there are some choices to be made, so you do see some minor differences. Uh, and what's been plotted here is the temperature anomaly relative to a climatological period of 1960 to 1990. So the temperature anomaly relative to that period as a function of time since 1850, which is often considered the pre-industrial baseline, relative to which climate change is measured. And so what you see here is that these four different groups, you know, there's some minor variations, but they're basically giving you the same answer. And you can always ask yourself, well, do they want to get the same answer? Are they colluding? And this does happen in science, where you do sometimes have you know, different teams converging to the same answers, because there's sort of societal and peer pressures to, to do so. Um, but if you sort of uh, if you go online and look up the Berkeley Earth Temperature Series, uh, you'll find that the, the person who put this together was himself skeptical <coughs> of, the, of the work these other groups had done. Uh, it was Richard Muller uh, from Berkeley, someone I actually talked with, and actually teaching his classes what got me into climate science. Um, and he was skeptical about the methods they used to reconstruct the temperature fields, so he decided to go on on his own. And he actually got funding from the Koch brothers, right, Charles and Koch, because <laughs> he was sufficiently skeptical that they thought that he'd already made up his mind and he was going to give them the answers that they wanted. But this is what we found. Do you have a question? Another question. Yeah. So in eight, so um, sort of in the 1850s, what are they? So are they extrapolating data from the 1850s, or are they actually? Are, are, is there are there measurements of the rain? So these are all these are all measurements okay. from thermometers that were there at the time. Wow. Um, so the coverage was much more sparse, and so you see that some of the time series don't make sense back that far because they just thought, ah, oh, that data is so spotty, we're not going to touch it. Please back off from what you're saying. Please. How did they? Um, so as time goes on, they have more. Uh, Absolutely. Temperature. Yes. And yes. So how are they extrapolating back that far and, and normalizing that? 
Um, so there's lots of choices to be made. A lot of it gets technical. And so you know, basically, there's two issues. Is one is you know, if you have a data point here and a data point here, how do you interpolate between them, right? Um, and these and the distance between data points is going to get larger and larger as you go back in time. Um, the other issue is when you have sort of you know a lot of data points around one area and then fewer over here. How do you you don't want to sort of weight these guys all equally because they're kind of measuring the same thing. Right. Or also, um, that's measurement of the whole area, so that global ones. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. how are you able to interpolate in these changes? Probably quite large changes. I mean, you just do your best, and people have different ways, you know, have different methods of doing that, right? Um, so, I mean, you can imagine just linearly interpolating, right? Uh, or using more fancy, higher order methods of interpolation. I'm not familiar personally with the, with the various methods, but. That's a good question, and all these groups had different answers to that question. Uh, yeah. I assume that if you plot the temperature against CO2 rises, they would be in close correlation? Could you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, so the question was, if I plot temperature against CO2 rise, uh, there would be close correlation. Uh, so we're going to do that in a minute. And there's confounding factors. Um, and uh, I'll get more into those. But one thing is that there's internal variability in the system. There's long time scale uh, oscillations in the ocean um, that cause some of these up and downs. Uh, that has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. Um, these sort of sharp wiggles, a lot of those are El Nino, right? Um, so just the tropical oceans getting warmer and colder. Uh, again, not related to carbon dioxide. Another thing that is uh, highly confounding and, and a real problem for modelers, such as the people at GFDL, um, is that especially in the, the post-war period and the 60s and 70s, we emitted a lot of aerosols. We were burning coal, it was dirty, and it emitted a lot of sulfates that reflected sunlight and cooled the planet a little bit. For people who were around back then, you might remember a Time Magazine cover article talking about global cooling right in the 70s, because there was a trend for maybe 10 years or so of cooling. People were worried about that. So skeptics often say, oh, you know, you, 40 years ago you were worried about cooling, and now you've got to be worried about warming. You know, what am I supposed to believe? Um, so there's many confounding factors. So the correlation actually with, with increased CO2 these time scales isn't great, but I'm going to show you some plots so you can see for yourself. Mike. Uh, do you happen to know the data for uh, more recent years? It seems to end around 2010. The warmest years have been 2016, 2017, for example, which probably is much higher than what you're plotting here. Do you know those yes. numbers? Yeah, uh, I don't know those numbers, and now I'm actually wishing that I had dug that data up, because this is off an IPCC report that came out a few years ago. And in fact, uh, we'll, I'll show you a lot in a second where you see the so-called hiatus, uh, which is from kind of 2000 to 2010, roughly. And that's basically ended uh, with this recent round of uh, yeah. uh, There's another question back there. Well, I mean, this is just a, uh, a similar comment, because I don't know, just looking at the data is not super convincing to me that there's an actual increase. I uh -huh. mean, your variations of the order of 0.5 degrees, any kind of natural drug, I mean, not clearly within like two sigmas of your, I mean, it's not obvious, yes. right? If you it's, no, it's, it's not <laughs> obvious, right? And so that, that's why the next, the next two slides are going to be, how do we, why do we think this is CO2 and not just natural variability or something else? Right. Because right? so, that's a good question. Yes? Any difference, I mean, you're dating back to 1850. Are there any differences in uh, how precise the instrumentation is? In Absolutely. Um, and so that was, kind of um, you know, that was the beef that Rich Muller had at Berkeley. Because what will happen is that um, thermometers get changed out. You switch out an old one for a new one. Records are discontinuous. You stop taking measurements for 20 years, then you start back up again. Mm -hmm. And so how do you manage all that? You know, it becomes a real issue in statistics and data analysis. Um, so those are, those are real issues. Uh, and again, that's why some groups, their records don't even, the, the black curve and the red curve don't even extend uh, back before 1890 or so. Uh, what's meant as temperature anomaly? What's what's used as a reference measure? Sorry. What is meant by temperature anomaly? So it's, this is the anomaly. Used? What they do is they take uh, an average from 1960 to 1990, whatever that global temperature is, that that defines a reference point. And so these are uh, anomalies relative to that period. So it's just a difference. Like yeah, it's just a different. Yeah, that's right. The temperature and then if they have an average from exactly. The how come 1960? Uh, let's see, it's a good question. 1960 and 1990. So we're looking at that. There. That is a good question, but I, it does look like it would, it would be a little bit below zero. Um, Except 
there's a lot of a lot of uh, rise through. Yeah. Well, it's probably so Right, but the question is just that, uh, according to this, if I just take the average of this time series from 1960 to 1990, it should be zero, right? Uh, it's not obvious by I that it is, but it's also not obvious that it isn't just because there, there is a lot of noise, um, and especially right here, right? So, uh, is it also, if you look back in history, is it really that anomalous to see that kind of variation over uh, 150 years? Um, so that's uh, a point we're going to address, and it's related to another question. Um, you can look at, so we just don't have data going back much further. That's, it's instrumental, meaning we read temperature off a thermometer, right? There's data going back where you have to use proxies, tree rings and isotopes and things like that, but there's the error bars on those are much, uh, much bigger. All right, so let's, let's get to, okay, so clearly questions about this, right? So it's not, it's not like a slam dunk case that, you know, there's this huge global warming signal. So why do we think, so there's, there's some warming here. Why do we think it's significant? Why do we think it's caused by uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide? All right, so one thing you can do is turn to uh, these global climate models, right? So these are probably some of the most intricate computer programs known to humankind. Uh, there are a million or two million lines of code. Like I said, there's, uh, you know, we have a, a hometown climate modeling center at the Forestal Campus in Princeton. Um, and there are modeling centers like this, there's about two dozen of them uh, across the globe. And they participate regularly in these sort of model inter intercomparison projects. So that was, that's what the CMIP stand, uh, stands for. Um, I'm forgetting now what the C stands for. Karen, what does C stand for? I think, I guess, climate, right? Yeah. Climate Model Intercomparison Project. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're a little expert here. Um, all right, so, so what was the exercise uh, that they did? So what you do is you take you get your best estimates of the natural forcing, and by that uh, we mean uh, changes in the solar flux at the top of the Earth, as well as volcanic emissions, right? We have volcanoes, we can estimate um, how much uh, aerosols they sent into the, into the stratosphere, those aerosols reflect some sunlight, and you get some cooling. Um, and you can run the, you can run the models, uh, with these force books and just ask, what's the temperature response like? And so there's two different ensembles of these. And let's just focus maybe on one of them. Let's focus on the SEMA 5 ones, the most recent. So all the, these, these orange uh, or yellow kind of spaghetti lines, those are the individual model, model runs. And they're quite noisy because they've got all these internal oscillations, El Nino and whatnot. Uh, but you average over them and you get the red curve. And what you see looks like a fairly steady temperature punctuated by dips, and those dips correspond to the volcanoes, right? So in uh, 1991, you've got Pinatubo, that was a big one, and you can kind of go through and just say, okay, you know, this is another volcano, and you can name these, these eruptions, right? Um, and then you have the observations, right? And what you see, so this gets back to a question that was asked by a couple of people, what you see is that in terms of so one way to estimate the natural variability of the Earth um, is, to, is to look at the models. The models are not perfect. They, you know, there's many flaws, and, and there are reasons to uh, to not to, to question the results. Um, but if you look at their natural variability, right, you get this envelope, and what you see is that you know all the way up until about you know 1960 or so, the sort of the the observations kind of lie within the envelope of the models. But once you get out here, there's this warming that's outside the envelope of the models. It doesn't seem like it could just be natural variable. The seizures go back uh, once, like, because it looks to me uh, just now on the, uh, the previous slide, in around 1860, it's like minus 0.5 on the observations. You go forward, it's like it's zero now. It's probably with respect to a different baseline. So okay. this is the baseline. Well, but then if you look at the top there, at the uh, at 2000, it's around maybe 0.75. Uh huh. If you go back to the other one, uh huh. It's also 0.75, roughly speaking. So I feel like it looks like it's not quite right on the on the other plot. Well, you know one of them is wrong. Let's see, Let's see here. So I'm guessing that uh, that this is the average across the whole globe, including ocean surface. Atmosphere above ocean. The previous one was only on land, which is always warm. That'd be my guess. Land surface air temperature. 
Thank you. I actually missed that. Yeah, that's right. Because the instrumental stations are primarily on land. Um, and in fact, Berkeley, they only have a land data set. Um, that's right. But, they are, but, they are, but some of the groups have ocean reconstructions as well. So the previous one is, uh, is an average with land and ocean. Is that right? So this is, uh, this is land only. OK. Uh, I think this is land and ocean. And you do expect the, the land to warm more, so you, you just see a larger warming signal. Good questions. All right. So then what you can do is you can take the models, and then in addition to feeding in these natural forcings, um, you feed in uh, increasing CO2, and you also feed in these aerosols that we've been emitting, right, from burning coal and other fossil fuels. And that's what you get. And so you see now that the observed warming fits within the envelope. And there's a lot of spread here, right? So there's uncertainty uh, about you know, how much warming the models predict. And one, should, you know, one cannot gloss over that. Um, but now the observations kind of lie within the envelope predicted by the models. So I think this is, this is one of the main reasons. It's not the only reason. I'm going to show you an entirely independent uh, line of evidence for this. Uh, this is one of the main reasons why people think that uh, CO2 is behind the observed warming, right? is that models can reproduce it when you feed it the increasing CO2, and they just can't if you don't give it the increased CO2. Um, but you might be skeptical of models, right? They're, they're extremely complicated. They're very hard to understand. And I mean, I spent a year in a modeling center. There's a lot of sausage making that goes on uh, into constructing these. And the modelers, when they're making the models, they know that this time series exists, right? And there are parameters in their models that aren't really set, but they can change to try and get a fit here, right? Um, so you'd like, you'd like that for to be some, some other evidence uh, uh, for this point. All right, so there's another thing you can do with just freshmen, or well, with, 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 with basic statistics, one, statistics 101 statistics. So how does that work? So what you do is you say, well, what are the things that would, that I think could influence global mean temperature? Well, there's El Nino, and for, for the time being, ignore the left axis that has a temperature on it. Just focus on the right axis, which just has ways of, which just give ways of quantifying um, these, these different phenomena. So this is an index of sea surface temperatures that quantify uh, these El Nino oscillations of Pacific um, ocean temperatures. Here's volcanic aerosols. You expect those to influence uh, global mean temperature. And this is just um, a measure of kind of how thick the aerosols are so and, uh, and how much sunlight they're going to reflect. Um, here you have solar radiance in watts per meter squared. So you see your 11-year sunspot cycles as well as a, as a small trend. Right? The, Earth is, the sun is slowly getting uh, brighter as time goes on. And it was dimmer in the past. Um, and then you have here an estimate of anthropogenic forcing which is a sum of the greenhouse gas signal here in red and the aerosol signal here. And this has very big air, air bars on it. So that's something that you have to keep in mind, though, the aerosol. Yeah. All right. So what do you do? You say, well, I think these are the things that really are, are controlling global mean temperature. But I don't know exactly, you know, for a given optical depth, I don't know exactly how to translate that to a temperature number. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll say, well, I think each of these each of these guys is contributing to the global mean temperature time series that's observed. And let me just say that there should be four coefficients, one for each of these things, that turns this quantity, in whatever units it has, into a corresponding temperature model. So there's going to be some number that tells me how much this contributes to variations of global mean temperature. And I do that for each of these, and then I run uh, a very basic statistics pr procedure uh, called a linear regression or a multilinear regression that sort of chooses these four coefficients such that they, when you add up each coefficient times each of these um, time series, each of these plots, they match the observed time series the best. So basically, I'm going to choose four numbers such that when I multiply each of these series by those numbers and add it up, it's going to give me it's going to give me the best fit possible for the observations. And that fit might not be very good. You don't know ahead of time if you're going to get a good fit. Because right? maybe you haven't chosen the right variables. Maybe there's other factors that are driving uh, global mean temperature, and they're not in your list. Is that procedure more or less clear? 
but you guys have a sense of what. Are they like weights? They're weights. Yep. They're weights. Yep. Fitting coefficients. Yep. Exactly. All right. So this is what you get. So the black uh, are the same um, uh, observed uh, temperature time series, and the green, which is a little bit hard to see, uh, is the fit from the statistical model. It's not perfect, you know, there's a dip here that it doesn't get, there's a rise here it doesn't get, but over the latter half of the 20th century it's quite good. Uh, and there's a statistical measure of its significance here which tells you um, that this, this statistical model is capturing 60 to 70 percent of the variation in global mean temperature, which is very significant. Right? So it does seem like these factors are explaining what global mean temperature is doing. Now that you have these coefficients, you can go back and you can take each of these time series and multiply them by that coefficient. Because remember, what that coefficient was doing was taking these native time series and turning it into a temperature anomaly, which should then sum up to this temperature anomaly. So that's what's plotted here on the left. right? And so you see, with these coefficients, the variations in El Nino have an amplitude of plus or minus 0.1 Kelvin. For aerosols, it's sort of similar, but it's all negative. For solar radiance, um, you know, maybe even smaller, plus minus, you know, 0.5, maybe 0.1 Kelvin. But then when you look at the anthropogenic forcing, right, you're up to 0.6 Kelvin. That's just from a from a from a statistical model that you would learn in the first statistics class and you would take as an undergrad. So there's no sort of you know complicated million lines of code general circulation model, right? This is this is stats 101. It's very simple. Um, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of ways to cook the books on this. Um, so this is a, a, another independent line of inquiry, a side and global climate model that is giving, is telling you the same story <coughs> that you can't account for for the observed temperatures without the greenhouse gases. That's what it's telling. And you might say, well, this is just one study, but there have been four, there have been three other other groups that have tried similar things, right? And so it's plotted here are, black is the, um, uh, the observed temperatures, the different colors are these four different statistical re reconstructions from El Nino, volcanoes, solar variations, and anthropogenic um, emissions. And again, the stories are all consistent, right? They're not identical, but they're all saying these are now all plotted on the, on the same, um, same vertical axis. You see that the amplitude of the signal from the, uh, the, the anthropogenic sources outweighs these guys, especially the trend. All right, so just to review. So you know, one basic claim is that atmospheric CO2 is increasing, and the evidence for that comes from independent measurements at independent sites of atmospheric CO2. Another claim you hear is that this increase comes from combustion of fossil fuel, and this is indeed consistent with inventories of fossil fuels that you get by looking at how much fossil fuels is produced, and also looking at the drawdown in oxygen uh, that you would get from combustion, uh, as well as uh, isotopic arguments. And finally, both really complicated and very simple models tell you that to replicate the observed warming, you have to include the CO2 greenhouse effect. If you don't, then you can't replicate. Um, so that's all I have for now, and I'm happy to take questions and continue the discussion. Yes? We often hear that 97% of climate scientists agree that uh, the Earth is getting warmer. Yeah. That seems to be based on one meta-study. Are there other meta-studies that validate that? I don't know. Um, I don't really... I don't find that argument compelling, right? Because that's just an appeal to authority. And you know, people who are skeptical, it's not just that they're skeptical of the science, they're skeptical of the scientists. You know, there's a perception out there, maybe not in this room, but there's a there's a perception out there that climate scientists are, you know, closet environmentalists. We have an environmentalist agenda. And you know, when we run a global climate model, we can kind of fudge the numbers um, to, to get things the way we want. And so, you know, sort of, so, sort of beat people over the head and say, oh, well, scientists all agree. Well, the problem is that they don't trust scientists in the first place, right? Uh, and so that's why, now, of course, you know, if someone is a conspiracy theorist and doesn't trust anything that anyone says, then what can you do? 
But part of what I wanted to do here was get back to the evidence, the thing that the scientists themselves get confidence from. And I wanted to try and share that with the public. So rather than having to trust a scientist, right, they have a sense of where the scientist's confidence is coming from. Um, there may be other meta studies, I don't know. I, I haven't followed that much. Yes? So, taking back off that. Yeah. So I mean, I'm thinking one of the things I'm most skeptical about is the science ability to convince the public using evidence-based approaches. And uh, my favorite example of that is the um, 1976 photograph that was taken of a fire escape that was collapsing as a woman and a child kind of falling down. <coughs> and immediately the next day, there was you know, citywide changes to institute fire, safe, um, fire escape safety rules. Uh -huh. And I think about that you know, as a scientist also, like, could I have done the same kind of impact? Had, had, could I have had the same kind of impact if I had done like, measurements of all the fire escapes across you know, Boston in 1975 <laughs> and tried to convince the, the government to you know, institute these kind of rules? Right. While like, you know, in, a, you know, in a singular moment, a photograph was taken and you had this huge impact across yeah. the entire city. So yes. I, how do you feel about that as a scientist yourself? The fact that sometimes things that maybe a little sensational actually galvanize people to action more so than more sober, dry, <laughs> scientific fact. That's a great question. I mean, you know, what was it? Summers of like 2011, 2012 were just crazy hot and there were heat waves just across most of the country. And it just felt like everyone was talking about climate change. You couldn't deny it. And I just, it just felt like the momentum was headed there. You know? But that was just a couple summers. Things changed, um, so that almost seems like an analog to something that's sort of more anecdotal, but really galvanizes people. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a great question. I don't think I have a good answer for you. I mean, you know, climate by definition is some sort of statistical average, right? And so, and there's so much variability. And I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why climate science is complicated and why the debate is so fraught. But that is one of them, right? That we're really talking about. You know, you want to average over 30 years. Right, to see a signal. And so all these up and down, ups and downs are in some ways kind of distracting. Um, there are still some, you know, sort of, there is still some sensational science that gets done. Um, so James Hansen, who's an outspoken, who's, I mean, a total bona fide climate scientist, published fundamental papers in the field, um, but he's also an advocate. Uh, he published a paper recently saying that, you know, they did some experiments where they melted a bunch of ice in the, um, in the northern Atlantic, and it, uh, the ice water doesn't have much salt, um, so it freshens the water in the North Atlantic, and then uh, fresher water, which is less salty, doesn't want to sink as much, and so it slows down the ocean circulation. And if you slow down that ocean circulation, this is a global ocean circulation, it has global impacts. And so they wrote this paper that said, oh my god, you know, we shut down the the Atlantic thermal headline circulation and the whole climate changed, you know? And it was sensational. Um, and the reviews for this paper are online, and there was one reviewer who was excellent, and he, he quoted Carl Sagan, and he said, you know, extraordinary claims re require extraordinary evidence. And the evidence here is not extraordinary. Um, so I, so the, the couple of examples that come to mind for me of that ilk, actually, especially since the debate is so polarized, and so there's so much skepticism, and, and, I do, and I feel that to some degree, some of it has some merit. Um, I feel like studies like that that are a little bit overplayed or a little bit sensational kind of undermine a that, critical. That's my that's my take. You know, I know there's people in the field who feel like, you know, uh, you know that they have to sound the alarm bells. Yeah, but I guess what I'm asking is like not just the impact that scientists can have, but you know, how do we galvanize non-scientists to do that work for us? Like, you know, like this photographer is not a scientist. He's not a celebrity. They're doing it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it's happening, right? I mean, James Vlog, right, has the, had that movie, uh, Chasing Ice, right? Uh, and I mean, he devoted years of his life to setting up photograph uh, cameras that would take, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but he set up cameras all over the globe, you know, and I don't know, 10 glaciers and different places in Iceland and Greenland, all over the place, and he set up cameras to take uh, like a picture every day for years. And he has these amazing time-lapse movies, and you can go to his website, chasingice.com or whatever it is, uh, and watch incredible time-lapse movies. Of that those are those are powerful. Um, the trouble is that that's remote, right? So a lot of people are like, eh, it's far, it's far away. Um, you know, the New York Times just had a piece over the weekend, which many of you may have saw. It was a special insert to the Sunday section about um, uh, rising sea level in Louisiana and coastal communities. 
um, that are facing sort of extinction, basically. Um, so, so I think they're trying. It's tough, though. You know, the headline. I, I struggle. Um, the headline for so there's a special supplement and it says you know uh, rising seas from climate change are displacing you know communities and, and this community's going to vanish forever, right? But I've looked at these numbers. And I know that you know the, the, the sea level rise uh, from climate change is not the whole story, right? There's a lot of subsidence happening uh, on the Gulf Coast, right? And in many places, that's the dominant effect. And I thought, ah, oh, rising seas from climate change, like that's a little dishonest. So then I open to the next page, right? And the next page, it has you know, there's like the three sentences that are like the first uh, beginning of the paragraph, and there it says rising seas from subsidence, erosion, and climate change, and they don't quantify any of it. So there's a little bit of sleight of hand there, you know? And I, I'm uncomfortable with that. So it's, it's a tricky thing to, to navigate. Right. Okay. Yeah, but there's also, for that problem, there's also a geology side of things also. Absolutely. It, it, it is all, just because you're changing climate change through subsidence doesn't mean it's not climate change. Because you're changing the topography of the land by taking water from the water table. That's true. So it's, so it's, it's man-made. Yeah. That's right. Um, so it's, it's part of the equation. It's part of the equation, and it's part of human impacts on the environment, for sure. Um, but I guess for me, like to call it climate, I mean, th there's an unmistakable link to CO2, fossil fuel burning, and you know, pulling water from aquifers doesn't really have much to do with driving cars and burning coal and power plants. And to conflate the two, I think, I don't know. It just it feels, uh, you know, sloppy at best, disingenuous at worst. And again, there's so many skeptics out there. Um, including in this town and on the faculty of the university. And I think they read that stuff and they pick up on it and it drives them mad. And I don't blame them. You know? And I'd like to clean up our communications a little bit so that they feel like we're being more. And the other thing that it does is that then it makes them feel like we've got an agenda. Because why is there this sleight of hand in the New York Times? Why does the front page say climate change? And why does the second page say climate change, subsidence, and erosion? Right? Do they have an agenda? I don't know. You know some people think climate models have an agenda, but I've been inside the building. And I don't, I don't feel that they do. You know, I think they're doing honest work, and it sometimes gets misinterpreted. So I don't know what's happening in the New York Times, but it opens yourself up to, up to suspicion, and that's not helping us. Yes. Some of the substance is due to the drilling of tens of thousands of wells due to the uh, oil industry, too. Yes. Uh, my, right. my main question is, uh, what is the uh, persistence of CO2 in the atmosphere in terms of years or centuries? And as a result, is it appropriate to characterize climate change in, in human terms as irreversible? I don't think that's an unfair way to. It sounds dramatic, but I, I think it's I think it's fair. Um, so I, I think the the current understanding is that you emit CO two, it warms the globe, but you know as we saw, not all the CO two that we emit stays in the atmosphere. The ocean draws it down, right? So you think, oh, well, that's fine. We'll just wait for the ocean to draw it all down, and then we'll be cool, right? The ocean will draw most of it down. Uh, it'll take hundreds of years, right? Um, but there's something else that happens. Uh, you can roughly think of the ocean as being composed of a surface layer that's like 100 meters deep, and then a deep ocean that's like 4,000 meters deep. And what we're really seeing right now is just this, this mixed layer, this, this top 100 meters that's warming up. And it's warming up because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's absorbing the same sunlight that it's always absorbed, but the amount of infrared light that's escaping to space from the surface of the atmosphere has been reduced because of the greenhouse effect from CO2. So this mixed layer of ocean is warming up. Now, what it's doing right now is it's warming up. It's emitting some of that. It's, it's getting rid of some energy by emitting it to space by infrared radiation, but it's getting rid of some other parts of the energy by warming the deep ocean, all right? That's what's happening now. This is part of the so-called transient climate response. But as time goes on, but I just said that the deep ocean would, would draw down CO2, right? But as it does that, it's also drawing down heat from that mixed layer. And so even though the CO2 in the atmosphere is gonna go down, the amount of heat that this mixed layer can send down to the deep ocean is also gonna be reduced because that deep ocean is gonna warm up. It's no longer going to be as, as receptive to that heat from the mixed layer. It turns out, and I don't think that our community has a great understanding of it yet, but what that ends up meaning is that you emit CO2, you, you know, fairly quickly, you know, in years or just a few decades, you get a certain amount of warming. 
And then that, le that warming actually levels off. And then even though the CO2 concentrations are decreasing, because you also have the deep ocean taking up heat, the temperature at the surface basically remains constant for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, even as the CO2 is getting drawn down. Because you're getting you're, the deep ocean is taking up heat as well. So what that ends up meaning is that, and this is, you know, if you're sort of conversant with the, the policy conversations on this, that ends up meaning is that the eventual warming that we're committing to on timescales of hundreds of years is really proportional not to our annual emissions, but to the cumulative emissions, the total amount of CO2 that we've pumped into the atmosphere. Um, and so the way that the, the numbers work is that if we want to stay under 2 degrees C, we're basically halfway there in terms of the CO2 that we've emitted, uh, basically 500 gigatons. And if we emit another 500 giga gigatons and we get up to a trillion tons, that's enough to, at least according to our model projections, bake in a relatively flat 2 degrees C of warming for, like I said, hundreds of years, thousands of years. I want to follow it up with uh, biological processes. Yes. We are talking about acidification and the fact mm -hmm. that on land, trees are kind of feasting. Mm -hmm. um, all this photosynthesis, all those you know, plants, animals, whatever, doing that, wouldn't they draw down some of that too? And how come, is it just a simple rate equation that they're just not keeping up? Uh, now that they're kind of feasting, I mean. They, they, they are drawing it down now. So, so right now the rough numbers are that, you know, of the CO2 that we, uh, of the emissions that we put in the atmosphere, 50% um, stays in the atmosphere, a quarter goes in the ocean, and a quarter gets taken up by the land. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't understand the biology of it. The biological systems are just so much more complicated than the physical and chemical systems. Um, my impression is that we don't really, we can't confidently project how that's going to evolve in the future. With the ocean, we can kind of run through, you know, ocean biogeochem or ocean geochemistry. Um, you know, see which it solves and how it's buffered and stuff like that, and we can project it out. Uh, but in terms of what the land's going to do, um, I don't think we know. Um, so in terms of the long-term conversation, we tend to think about oceans because we just don't know what to say about them. Okay. We're going to take a couple more questions and then... Yeah, why don't we do two more questions and then we can wrap up. And so, okay, great. Um, so, it was the clean where, you, you know, you had those four time series and you try to fit them uh, and they sort of fit to the uh, long-term uh, temperature scale. Is the claim there that about this? Fits, yeah, that's right. Is, is the claim that it fits to the long-term drift? Because I, I, I guess my question is, you know, the long-term behavior, in most, it looks like a linear behavior, I mean, with all of that, you know, noise. And if you've got four fit parameters, you've got four coefficients that you're fitting to a linear graph, I'm not sure. Can you try to explain a little how, how this is actually... Uh, so you're saying you, you see this is roughly linear? That's right. I mean, with, with the noise, right? It looks sort of like... Yeah, okay, that's fine. Plot. And you have four fit coefficients. Right. So it's, it just seems to me like it's... But the coefficients are multiplying these time series, right? Well, sure, sure, but you have, you know, four, you know, you have four degrees of freedom, but your, I mean, your observation <coughs> seems like it's just only a model. I mean, you have four degrees of freedom, but I mean, if I look at, say, from 1950 onward, <coughs> it's pretty much nailing it, right? So that's, that's a lot of points to nail, right? You can't, you can't tune four numbers, right? If I go from 1960 onwards to, you know, whatever that is, 2010, <coughs> it's 50 years, it's 50 points. You know, fitting four coefficients doesn't give you a fit like that. Uh, if, if it's if it's if the uh, just by chance, right? Well, I mean, the, the other thing, right, is that then you have to ask if, if if you're saying this thing is just linear, then you have to look at these influences and go, okay, well, like, you know, which of these things both has a linear trend, right? That I could use to get this. Um, well, okay, the solar radius has a linear trend, but if I use that to account for all this, then I'm going to get huge swings with the solar cycle. We just don't see that. Well, I guess, right. yeah. It just and the, and these guys don't really have trends in the right direction, right? The volcanic trend is, is negative because we have more volcanic activity uh, later in the period than earlier. So that really leaves this, right? Now you could say, oh, well, maybe there's other things that, that you know, other explanatory variables that I should be including here. <coughs> Doubtless you're right, right? But the fact that the R value here is 0.8, right? Uh, and that you're fitting, you know, 65% of the variance means that you're getting a good chunk of it. So it doesn't leave a lot of room for some completely other explanation. You know, I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, it's, it, you know that, that everything in the observed time series is explained by different things, but I, I have a hard time seeing how, how 
how you reach another basic conclusion. Uh, if I can do that another one. Yeah, sure. Now. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I guess it's not obvious to me uh, with the previous question if, if it's a land temperature versus a, a combined, mm -hmm. that it just only affect, um, I would imagine it just gives an offset, right? Rather than because you know just now it was at zero, one side at zero, one side is at zero, but the other side is point seven five. So you know if it's, it just seems to me like you should get a, a constant shift rather than a scaling. In, oh, and going from land to ocean. Yeah. But, but you, uh, the, the second graph didn't say what the baseline was, and the problem with a lot of these is that many of these graphs will choose a different average time period to define zero. Sometimes well, it's earlier, sometimes. Yeah, but, yeah, so. But change the scale. Like. I, 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 I think on, on I, land you went. You're, you're, you're just saying that the, that the, you know, if I go from pre-industrial, kind of by I, average, taking after right. pre-industrial, then by I, taking after 2010, see a bigger change over land. The, the delta. Right, right. From the beginning to the end is bigger over land than it is over ocean. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. It is um, true. So it, it is expected to be true. Uh, there's actually some, some basic physical reasons for this. Uh, we, we can talk offline afterwards about, about why you expect this to be true. Um, and it basically has to do with moisture availability and the fact that, you know. Uh, anyway. and, and this is something you see in models. If you, if you take a model run and you warm the ocean by 4 degrees, the land warms more than that. You know, uh, just from, even though you don't set the land temperature, just by feeling the influence of the ocean, the ocean gets 4 degrees warmer, the land gets, you know, so, one. Uh, one, all right, you can add the last question. What other right. things should we be looking at that we're probably not thinking about? Just from your perspective, your opinion. As someone who is just paying attention to the climate change conversation, or someone who's trying to do something about climate change, or right, just your opinion. Like, what are what are some other things we could look into? What are some other things that we've been missing? Um, maybe have like a, a different perspective on it to. Because we don't know, maybe we don't have the problem more. Yeah. Like, I'm just curious, what, what do you think we should do to improve on and, and um, get better, more uh, precise injuries? I just loaded the question. No, no, it's, it's, it's great. I should, I, should, I should come prepared uh, to ask the questions. You kind please. of said it, right? Just providing the sources. If you're, you're talking about improving the conversation. I mean, he, he was asking, you know, yeah, I mean, what, what's something we could do? kind of more broadly, but, but yes, that's where I was going. The, the thing that concerns me is um, uh, is the tone of the conversation and the content of the conversation. Um, and, you know, me giving this presentation is, is my own way to try and, and improve it. Um, and so I think, you know, focusing on specific claims, you know, like when people say the science is settled, what does that even mean, right? I hope, I hope Hope none of you go out there and say that to anyone in any seriousness, right? Because what does that mean? What science? What claim? Right? There are some claims that the claims that I'm showing you tonight, I would argue, you know, to a, a, a good degree of confidence, are settled. You know, there's just multiple lines of evidence that, that are consistent, um, and certainly in the community of people who think about things like this, there's not much doubt. And there's other things about which there's huge uncertainties, right? How much of the warming we're seeing is right now is CO2, and how much of it is just the absence of aerosols, right? The fact that we cleaned up the air, we no longer have sulfur in the atmosphere that was making acid rain, it's gone now, right? We don't know the answer to that question, right? Um, you know, these uh, ice sheets in Antarctica, which were the subject of another, you know, big, beautiful New York Times multi-page cover story, which also was misleading, right? Uh, if you look into the details, right? How much of a risk is that? We just don't know. Right? Um, can you, you know, one thing that Rob Sokolov at, uh, uh, at Princeton, at, at PEI Mechanical Engineering, always asked me, he goes, can we rule out a world that, you know, is, that has a very high climate sensitivity or very low one? And we can't, right? The models right now, you know, the, the central estimate is that uh, if you double CO2, they warm by three degrees, right? But the spread is one and a half to four and a half degrees, right? And the outliers are even bigger than that, right? <coughs> And if you compare that, so that's like a factor of three uncertainty, right, in the, in the response of the physical system, right? And that's actually comparable, if you think about the uncertainty in what we're going to do, how much we're going to emit, there's these two, there's these range of scenarios that the IPCC puts forward. Um, they call these uh, representative concentration pathways. They're basically 
Modelers who model the economy and agriculture and population make projections about what the global economy is, what the world is going to do uh, going forward over the next hundred years. And they have different scenarios, scenarios in which we just keep emitting, scenarios in which we uh, you know, abate emissions. And the end members, right, the high emission scenario is RCP 8.5, meaning that our emissions are providing a forcing of 8.5 watts per meter squared. Uh, which corresponds to something like um, something between a doubling and a, and a tripling of CO2. The low emission scenario is RCP 2.6, right? So that's a little over a factor of three uncertainty in what humans are going to do. But that's comparable to the uncertainty in how the climate system is going to respond. That science is not settled. Yeah. So I think moving away from language like that and focusing on specifics and on evidence, to me, to my mind, that would, that would help the conversation. And that's something I hope to see more of. Uh, okay, so on that note, why don't we wrap up? Let's, let's get on. Uh, and thanks to Casey Wagner for organizing this. You're doing a great job today. Uh, As I mentioned, I would like to try to make this a monthly series, and I would very much appreciate feedback that you have. Uh, there are ways that you can give me that feedback. You can stick around afterwards and talk to me. Uh, on the table out there, there are some laminated cards that have a QR code where it'll actually take you to a Google survey you can fill out. It'll take five minutes at most. It asks questions about tonight's talk. Yeah, there's a quiz. There's a quiz, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but then it also asks about, you know, what are future events you might like. Also, another way to access that is if right now you send an email to scienceontapprinceton at gmail.com you'll get a response with a link to fill out the survey, okay? Uh, I really want any feedback you have, all right? I'm also trying to learn how much do people learn by coming to things like this, right? Uh, of course, tonight, we learned a lot, but uh, <laughs> I want to quantify that. So anyway, uh, thanks again, and uh, I hope that you guys come next time. There's, an email, there's a sign-up list if you would like to add your email to the, uh, to the list, sir. I'll email you next month, all right? So otherwise, have fun, buy more beer. Uh, <laughs> that will help ensure that we have another event. <laughs> so, thank you.